Welcome, everybody. Welcome again to those of you joining us via Zoom. I need to ask your permission for something this morning. There was a fella here with a ponytail and a whiteboard a few weeks ago, and he got a little teachy. <laughs> Can I get a little teachy this morning? Can I do that? You did it for him, will it? <laughs> he, <clears throat> okay, I'd, I'd like to be a little teachy this morning. You might remember last week, we explored how Jesus stood before this crowd. He had compassion on them. And what was the first thing that Jesus did in Mark 6 last week? He taught them. A central part of Jesus' ministry was to teach. Jesus had compassion on the crowd, and he taught them many things. And throughout Jesus' ministry, one of the central ways or modes in which he taught was through parables. Over the next few weeks, we are going to spend some time listening and learning from the parables, the teachings of Jesus. we got some learned folks in here this morning. <laughs> what would you say a parable is? How would you describe a parable? And I'm asking you, this isn't rhetorical, let's, let's learn together. A story, fantastic. Well, never mind, yeah, I agree, a story. Okay, he's teaching. <laughs> okay, so, so people can hear parallel lines, pattern? Okay, okay, so instruction, okay. Anything else? A relatable story, okay. Okay. An earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Those are fantastic descriptions of a parable. Anybody else before I move on? Marion? A special message, okay. Revealing something of heaven. All good answers. We're going to chew on this over the next few weeks. Tim's going to get us with the parable next week. But parables are stories, as Martin said illustrations from everyday life that reveal to us what the kingdom of God is like and our relationship to it. We hit all these points. <laughs> Parables often prompt reflection. There are layers of meaning to a parable. And we can spend our whole lives chewing and reflecting on parables. Fred, I bet you read a parable 30 years ago that when you read today seems a little different to you. <laughs> Reflect a little different. They're like pearls. You look at it from a different angle, you see something different. But parables, they have an important function. And I want to talk about this today. Parables, by their design, they draw out a response from their hearers. Parables, by their nature, they provoke, they prompt a reaction from those who hear them. Parables poke the hearers right in that challenging spot. They kick us right in the gut. <laughs> And they, they call us to make a choice. That's what parables do. And often that choice is to step more and more into following Jesus Christ or to turn our backs and to walk away. We see that throughout Jesus' ministry when he taught. When Jesus was teaching and teaching parables, take the example of the Good Samaritan. He teaches the teachers of the law that everybody is your neighbor, even the Samaritans whom you despise. And for the teachers of the law, it's too much. They turn their back. No, don't want anything to do with that. And they eventually trap Jesus, kill him, and crucify him. <laughs> they don't like his parables. Parables, by their design, they elicit a response to either follow Jesus or to turn away. With parables as a way of redemption or a way of rejection, which is its own condemnation. And the parable that we're going to begin with this morning is the parable that Jesus begins with in all of his Gospels. Well, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. No parables in John. But the first parable that Jesus begins with is the parable of the good sower. Familiar to anybody? Mark chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. And you know what I love about this parable? Jesus tells us what it means. <laughs> this is one of the few parables where Jesus... So we're starting easy this morning. But we're taking the easy way out. We're cheating. Jesus tells us what it means. We don't have to scratch our heads for a while and think about it, because I know that happens to me with parables. Here's the word of the Lord from Mark chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake, while all the people <clears throat> were along the shore at the water's edge. He taught them many things by 
parables. And in his teaching said, Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came along and they ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came out, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants, so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some 100 times. And then Jesus said, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Do you get it? Are we hearing? <laughs> some of us scratching our heads? The disciples did. When they were on their own, the twelve and the others around him asked him, what's the story with those parables? <laughs> he said to them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But those on the outside, everything is said in parables, so that some may be ever seeing but never perceiving, and ever hearing but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. Then Jesus said to them, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? He tells us what it means. The farmer sows the word. And some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and he takes it away. The word that was sown in them. Others like seed on, a rocky, on rocky places. They hear the word and at once they receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes, because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seeds sown among thorns, they hear the word. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth and the desires of other things, they come in and they choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seeds sown on good soil, they hear the word, they accept it, and produce a crop. Some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The most important word that Jesus says in this parable is the first word. What's the first word that Jesus says in this parable? Verse 3, if you got it in front of me. Listen! Listen! Wake up! Pay attention! Listen! Notice the exclamation mark in your NIV in front of, next to that? That is the NIV's way of telling us that this is a command. This is a loud command. Listen. This isn't a, come here and I tell you. <laughs> this isn't a, come gather round and listen to my tale. No, this is a boisterous command. Wake up, pay attention, listen. Have you got that KJV with you? Does it say hearken? Hearken! <laughs> hearken! The first word, listen, is an important word, not only because it grabs our attention, and it sort of echoes back to the Old Testament. Hear, listen, O Israel, Shema. Catches our attention. But it's also like a key to understanding this parable, and let me tell you what I mean. You can't see this in the English translation. So I took the liberty of showing you in the Greek this morning. Don't be alarmed. <laughs> going to come up on the screen here in a sec. These are just old words, okay? Don't be alive. These are ancient words, ever true, okay? That first word up there, akuate, that's our word, listen. That's the command, listen. What I want you to see is how many more times Mark weaves that same word, akuate, throughout this passage. Look at it, akuate, aku, 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 aku. Nine times in our passage, and throughout all of Mark's parable material, 33 times. Mark uses that same root, a coup, like a repeated signpost. If you want to know what this is about, it's about listening. <laughs> if you want to know what it's about, it's about listening. This was a, a device used in ancient writings, that they would repeat that same phrase, pointing to its meaning. And Mark is showing us in the original language that this parable has a lot to do with listening. But what kind of listening? What kind of listening are we talking about here? Simply hearing with our ears? Is Jesus saying, hey, can you hear me down the back there? Is it simply audio signals? No. It's the kind of listening 
that makes it into our ears, into our hearts, and out into our actions. That's true listening. Like the wife who drops a hint to her husband about seeing that romantic comedy come date night. Date night comes around, he's got the tickets. What does she say? You were listening. True listening is hearing converted into action. Listen, says Jesus to the crowd. Some of the crowd were having trouble with listening. <laughs> and Jesus talks about this. They see with their eyes. They see me heal. They see me do amazing things. But they don't fully perceive it. <laughs> they don't fully see what's going on. They hear my words, but they don't understand. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. That's what Jesus says. The crowd is struggling with listening. And so Jesus speaks to this crowd to wake them up, to listen, by way of a parable. And the parable goes a little like this. The farmer went out to sow seeds, says Jesus. And if you think about it, the farmer scatters everywhere and anywhere. <laughs> He's pretty liberal with the seed, if you think about it. Some seeds fall on the path. The birds come and they eat it up. Some seeds fall on rocky ground. The seeds sprout up, but they don't last long because there's no, there's no room for the roots to grow, the stone. Other seeds fall amongst thorny soil. The shoots come up, but they are smothered by the thorns and bear no grain. But still some fall on good soil and produce an abundant harvest yield. And we need not tiptoe around it. Jesus tells us what it means. <laughs> the seed is the word of God. The seed is the good news of the kingdom preached everywhere and to anyone. And the soil is people's responses to the word. We got that? Seed is the word. Soil is people's response to the word. Some people like seed on the pot, says Jesus. They hear the word, but it's rejected. Some are so given over to the powers of this world that they push away God's kingdom. In fact, Jesus says that the enemy, Satan, has something to do with this. The word is spoken, but it's snatched away. It's rejected in an instant. Others hear the word, says Jesus, but they are like stony soil. They first receive the word with joy. Amen. Hallelujah. But when the obstacles of life come, the stones of life get thrown at them. They fall away. And the word that was planted withers and dies. Other people, says Jesus, hear the word, but they're like thorny soil. They never bear the fruit of the word in their lives because the thorns kind of choke it out. They're more concerned about their worries and their desires. Like thorns, they choke out the word of God. And it bears no fruit in their lives. But still some are like good soil. They akuate, they listen, they accept, and they bear fruit. And of course, the lingering question that Jesus leaves with the crowd is what kind of soil are you? What kind of soil are you? Are we listening? Are we hearing? Are we accepting and bearing the fruit of the kingdom in our lives? That's the question. I heard an experienced pastor friend talk about this passage once. And he said, I've seen this parable play out before my very eyes over 50 years of ministry. He said, I preached the gospel, the good news, the coming kingdom, the teachings of God to some people, and they looked at me like I was an absolute buffoon. <laughs> what are you talking about? Brushed it away is nonsense. You're an idiot. And you're God's fiction. Yeah, they did. That's soil number one. <laughs> Rejection. Enemy snatches it away. He's seen it play out before his very eyes. He said, I've preached the word. And in that moment, people are cut to the heart. They come up the front of the church, weeping tears of joy, having encountered God's love and his power. They lay their lives down at Jesus' feet, accepting his salvation and forgiveness and the power of his word. Amen. Hallelujah. 
But somewhere along the way, they stopped showing up. Stop coming. They initially were doing okay. They came up with tears of joy. But somewhere along the way, they turned back to the same old, same old. And they were singing, just crying tears of sorrow again. <laughs> That's soil number two. <laughs> Didn't sink very deep. I mean, the pressures of life came. They walked away, and the word didn't bear much fruit in their lives. He said, I've preached to others for some 40-odd years. <laughs> the same people. They came to the Bible study. They came to the conferences. They heard more word than a scribe transcribing. But the, fruit didn't, the, the word didn't seem to bear any fruit in their lives. He said, when the troubles of life would come, the word of God seemed powerless. They were more concerned about who the president was going to be. They were more concerned about who's got this vaccine thing figured out. That the word of God seemed powerless, ineffective for their worries and concerns. Not only that, but they were more concerned about their own security, their own wealth, their own position, their own reputation. That the word of God couldn't quite seem to break through and change their character and behavior. He said, in fact, they grew increasingly more thorny. <laughs> The opposite of fruit. Sitting in church for 40 years and they grew more thorny in the board meetings. <laughs> they got grumpier and angrier when things didn't go their way. They got impatient with people who were different from them. They were unforgiving to those who run them. The word seemed stifled by their worries and themselves. <laughs> That's soil number three. <laughs> I've seen it play out before my very eyes, he said. He said, I've preached the word to some whom he never would have expected. But they listened. They accepted. And their lives were transformed. Families once torn apart, reconciled by the power of Jesus. Lives once corrupt and broken, renewed and restored. People who blossom the fruits of the kingdom in their families, their jobs, their neighborhoods, their schools, and they draw other people to that same power. They reap a sort of harvest. That's soil number four. I've seen it play out before my very eyes, he said. What soil are you? What soil are we this morning? What soil am I? <laughs> I think all of us would like to throw our hands up in the air and say, oh, number four, pastor, yep. Yeah. I'll take that door. <laughs> door number four, yep, yeah, that's me. But if we're honest, maybe there are times when two and three sort of resonate. <laughs> For some of us, maybe even number one <laughs> makes an appearance now and again. Maybe there are many of us here this morning who long to be that flourishing soil where the fruit of the kingdom bears witness in our lives. We long for that, but we keep falling short. Jesus, I want to bear more fruit for you, but I can't quite cut it. Maybe we feel poked right in that challenge spot <laughs> by this parable this morning. But that's what parables do. That's their design. That's the genius of parables, is they pinpoint our shortcomings. Parables, Jesus' parables, they show us how our lives are out of sync with the kingdom. Jesus' parables reveal to us our deficit, our weakness, our limitations. Ultimately, Jesus' parables reveal to us our need for God's gracious help. That's what parables do. You know why? Because all have fallen short of the glory of God. All of us. Jesus doesn't teach the people to simply make them feel bad about themselves. And if you feel that way this morning, that's not Jesus' intention. Jesus doesn't teach this parable to simply condemn. Jesus' desire, whether you are a Pharisee, whether you are a prostitute, whether you are a, a leper, whether you are a Galilean farmer, Jesus' intention in telling this parable is so that all might akuita, listen, accept, and bear the fruit of the kingdom in their life. Jesus' desire is that we might step more and more 
into the loving embrace of our gracious, forgiving God for help. That we would listen to the word and walk in step with God. Jesus, through this parable, wants to draw out a response from us, ultimately pulling us toward himself. That's what Jesus wants to do by this. We don't have what it takes. <laughs> we don't. You know who does? Jesus. Listen. Walk with me. Put your faith in me. And I'll bear the fruit of the kingdom in your life. That's what Jesus is saying. Abide in me. I'll abide in you. And what? You'll bear fruit. That's what Jesus said. I would have loved to have seen the faces of the Galilean farmers <laughs> when they heard this parable. Imagine them in the crowd looking at each other. What's he on about it? If you think about it, the, the, the farmer is so liberal <laughs> with the seed that he scatters. They're probably thinking, why is he throwing seed on uncultivated soil? <laughs> why is he throwing seed on a path? Why is he throwing seed on thorns of all places? What's this farmer up to? I think Jesus needs to learn a little bit more about farming. Well, maybe that's what they were thinking. But I think Jesus is showing us here the generosity of God. The generosity of God. The word, the good news of the kingdom will be preached to every nation and tribe as far as the east is from the west, north to south, rich or poor. The good news is for every life on this planet that we might call God's field. And in spite of many obstacles, God will reap a kingdom harvest. In spite of an enemy who seeks to destroy. In spite of shallow soil. In spite of our limitations. God will yield an abundant harvest for our good and for his glory. He will. And Jesus invites us. Akuete, listen and accept the word and bear the kingdom's fruit in your life. Are we a coup at Ted this morning? <laughs> One of the greatest privileges of my short ministry life so far was to be invited to Handlin Correctional Facility in Ionia, Michigan. Handlin is a man's prison. And I don't say this lightly, but the Word of God is transforming Handlin Prison in Ionia, Michigan. At Hanlon, there are men serving life sentences for horrific crimes, murders, assaults, horrible things, things we can't overlook. These are horrific crimes. But a few years ago, my seminary, in partnership with Calvin University, decided that they would put a, a ministry training program in the prison, equipping uh, those serving life sentences to understand and to apply God's word in their context. They put a ministry training program in the prison. And of course, when it first started, some people were like, what are you doing? These are the scum of the earth. That's a quote. They don't deserve this. Let them rot. They did horrific things. But as this parable shows us, God's pretty generous <laughs> with the seed of his word, isn't he? Even prisoners hear the good news. God's willing to plant his seed of his word in any soil. He's that generous. And the word of God, which these prisoners have listened and accepted, is transforming the lives of the people in this prison. Before the program started, the warden recounted that there was nearly 900 disciplinary tickets for fights, drug use, things within the prison. After a few years, that disciplinary ticket number had decreased to close to 200. 200 disciplinary tickets. The warden was so impressed that he had an ice cream party for the prisoners. That's what Jesus can do. He can turn a prison into an ice cream party. And the prisoners, taking this responsibility of planting within their field the word of God, they now teach the younger, young offenders. They teach them to get their education and to be best equipped for leaving. The, the, those who are serving life sentences teach the younger inmates. They have a chapel that meets multiple times a week. They have a Bible study. They have a prayer meeting that meets daily. 
exploring all kinds of prayers. The place is like a monastery. <laughs> it's mental. The prisoners at Hanlon who listen and accept the word of God are bearing God's fruit in their field. It is transforming their lives. I had the privilege to be invited to, to preach there a few times. And I was coming to minister to them. <laughs> Little seminary student with the Bible in my arm. <laughs> they ministered to me. They ministered to me. Let me tell you, they understand forgiveness. They understand God's love and abundance. They understand the power of God's words, because for them it's life and death. And they blessed me when I went up there. In fact, the, the fruit of their ministry is spilling outside of the prison to us this very morning. <laughs> Our gracious Savior calls us friends. Akua, to listen. Accept his word and bear the fruit of his kingdom, aided by his ever-present help. Abide in me. I'll abide in you. And you'll bear fruit. Quite simple. But invite Salome. Salome's going to help us in this moment. I'm not going to pray just yet. I want you to close your eyes. Reflect upon the words of these songs. And come to Jesus. Talk with Jesus. If something has poked within your heart today, talk to Jesus about it. Respond to Jesus today. Just quieten our hearts for a while. Salome. Again, my mind racing, I can't seem to win all these crazy thoughts and feelings. It's like it never ends until your voice breaks through my noise. And I know I'm not alone, I'm not alone. You will fight my battles if I will just be still. Why would I keep running when you're right here? I'll just be quiet and let you speak through the silence. Here I am, no more hiding. You are in this moment, I won't fight it. I'll be quiet. I don't need to know what comes next. Tomorrow's in your hands. I can trust you with my future cause you're already there. I hear your voice call me forward. And I know I'm not alone, I'm not alone. Away with the distractions. I want to hear what's true. The only words that matter, they come from you. I'll just be quiet and let you speak through the silence. Here I am, no more hiding. You are in this moment, I won't fight it. I'll be quiet. I'll just be quiet, let you speak through the silence, here I am no more hiding, you are in this moment, I won't fight it, I'll be quiet.
just be quiet God you're here in the silence here I am no more hiding you are in this moment I won't fight it I'll be quiet pray with me Lord Jesus, in this moment, we ask that you, by your kindness, would reach into the areas of our lives that need your touch, that need your help. Lord, we lay before you ourselves this morning. Lord, we recognize our weakness. We recognize our sin. We recognize the ways in which we fall short. But Lord, we recognize you. We recognize your power. We recognize your goodness. We recognize your grace and your love. And Lord, we ask that you would reach into the innermost parts of us and flood us with your love. Lord, we ask that you would plant the seed of your word deep within our souls, that we might be the kind of people who bear the fruit of your kingdom in our own lives, in our families, in our communities. Lord, we trust that you will reap a harvest for your kingdom because you promised you would. We give you our lives this morning and ask for your help. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and all God's people said, Amen.